All right. So, uh, flip it over to the other side. You're going to see the notes for today. And you'll see that I'm still on my alliteration kick. So we got a bunch of R's today. So we're going to be, I think last week we were marveling on the mercies of the matchless monarch. And this week we're going to be reflecting on the revelation of the righteous redeemer. And uh, in fact, when, when, I, you know, when I was thinking about this series of, of sermons, uh, they're not really lessons, but uh, anyway, lessons or sermons or whatever it is, um, this is one of the ones I was excited about, about studying and, and preaching through. Psalm 19 is one of my favorite psalms. In fact, my family right now is, is memorizing it. We're about halfway through. I think we we're working on verse number seven today. And so it's just, it's a wonderful song, that psalm that is absolutely chock full of truth. And uh, I, I think I've already uh, mentioned this, but uh, out of the three sermon series that we have going on right now, the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings, Galatians on Sunday evenings, and Psalms on, on Wednesdays, this has become my favorite out of all of them because I, I just love digging in and learning everything that I get to learn from the Psalms. And, and, and I, you guys just have to take my word for it. What I can present on Wednesday is only the tip of the iceberg of what I've been learning on Monday and Tuesday preparing for the, the Wednesday sermon. And so anyways, one of the, the blessings of being a preacher and a pastor is we get to dig into God's word and we get, uh, we, we get so much more than we're able to give back out. And, uh, I personally get that blessing, and I'm thankful I have the opportunity to do that. And uh, one of the things that uh, we need to understand is that we, we live in a, a day and age where a lot of people say, we don't need the Old Testament. You know, uh, we've, I've talked about this. Uh, famous pastors, I've even named their names on Sunday evening, that said we need to unhitch our Christianity from the Old Testament, or the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament, which is against everything that the Bible teaches, that God doesn't change. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, if your God uh, is different than the God of the Old Testament, you don't have the, the true God of the Bible, right? And so uh, these views that are very popular in, in, in what I call pop Christianity today are, are not just defective views, but they're dangerous views. And, and if you really follow them, if you really believe that that the God of the Old Testament is not the true God, then, then you're not believing in the God of the Bible. And so it can be even not just dangerous and defective, but also damning. Uh, we, 2,000 years after Christ, we have the wonderful honor and privilege to read the Old Testament through the lens of what Jesus did for us, through the lens of the New Testament we can see Jesus everywhere we read in the Old Testament. It's like, I remember when I was a kid, we used to uh, hunt for roly polies. Everyone knows what a roly poly, they have um, the roly polies in Texas, right? Those little, what do they call them? Doodle bugs. Doodle bugs. That's the first time I've heard that one. So uh, roly polies are doodle bugs, right? And where do you often find them? You find them under rocks and, and things like that. And so what we do is we go to the backyard. We go where we had a schoolyard uh, that we would search for them on. And we, we just get over and we start turning over rocks. And, and almost under every rock, you'll find something interesting, right? You'll find some kind of grub, some kind of a worm, some kind of a, a bug of some sort, right? And it's the same thing with us. We, we get to turn it over things in the Old Testament. And everywhere we turn, we see Jesus Christ. And I love it. I love it. Because this whole book, from beginning to the end, is all about one person. It's about Jesus Christ. And seeing the beauty of... and and and. Sometimes it's, he's hidden at first sight, like, like in Psalm chapter 19. But when we get to the end, I think you'll, you'll see Jesus Christ in Psalm 19. So um, the inscription to the psalm, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Now, this means, when it's addressed to the chief musician, this means that this was one of the, the main songs that was sung in the regular worship in the temple. And so the, the Hebrews, the Jews, they would hear this psalm very often. They would know this psalm very well. And uh, this psalm is very easily broken up into three portions. We're going to look first at nature's revelation about God. Then we're going to see scripture's revelation about God. And then we're going to look at ourselves 
and, and reflect on our own sinfulness at the end of this. So uh, now I don't read Hebrew, but those who do say that Psalm 19 in the Hebrew is the most beautiful out of all the poetry in the whole Bible. They said it, the, the, the way that they use the wording and the way every, the, it's constructed is the most beautiful language portion in the whole scriptures of Psalm, uh, Psalm 19. But what's interesting is, I even included this in your notes, this psalm combines the most beautiful poetry with some of the most profound biblical theology. Not only is it, is it a beautiful poem, but it teaches us a lot of wonderful things about God. So let's look at the first six verses. And in the first six verses, we see reflections on, the nature, on, the, on nature's revelation of God. Now, one of the things we need to understand I've mentioned this before, and I'm sure I'll mention it again, but, but the Bible teaches about God's revelation in two ways. God reveals himself to man in two ways. There is what's called general revelation, and there is special revelation. Now, general revelation is, is available to everyone. Uh, all times, every place, uh, it, it doesn't matter what culture you're in, what language you speak, where you live, and what time in the world that you live. Everyone has general revelation. And what is general revelation? It's creation. Creation declares that there is a creator. Nature proclaims that there is a God, that there is a mighty God. Special revelation is the Bible. It's God's written word, right? And and it's it's very and we're going to get into special revelation here in a couple minutes, but right now we're going to look at nature. And in fact, a lot theologians throughout the centuries they've said that that God has two books. He has the book of nature and the book of his holy word, the scripture, right? Both of them tell us a lot about God. Nature tells us a lot about God. Let's see what nature tells us from these first six verses. Number one, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now, there are two aspects of creation that are mentioned in this verse. First of all, we see the heavens, and second of all, we see the firmament. Now, these words are, are very similar, and they basically mean the same thing. They're, they're poetic ways of saying the sky sky over our head, right? So when we say the heavens and when we say the firmament, we're talking about the sky that we look up to in the day and in the night and, and things like that. Uh, now, notice the word heavens are plural. It doesn't say the heaven, it says the heavens. Now, what, what this means is it's talking about the different views of heaven we get from our perspective here on this earth. I mean, sometimes it's, it's partly cloudy, like it is right now. Uh, sometimes, like it is, was on Monday, it's stormy and, and dark and gray, right? Sometimes it's, uh, uh, we have uh, you know, those beautiful uh, cotton candy clouds all over the sky, and then sometimes the sky is green uh, because it's storm season and we're getting ready to get a tornado, right? We have many different views of the daytime sky, but also we have a different view when, when we look out at night. I think last night we got home kind of late from something we were doing, and, and there was there was a beautiful low-hanging orange crescent moon. I don't know if anyone saw it last night. I'd never really seen one so orange. It was a crescent moon. It was beautiful. And I love living outside of the city and uh, when we were in Ukraine and Russia and stuff like you don't really see stars because there's so many so many lights everywhere and you're living in an apartment and all the city lights everywhere. But, but being out in the country, you get to see the beautiful aspect of creation that we get to see at night, the stars. And the, the stars, the Bible says, the heavens declare God's glory. The word firmament, heavens, we can really easily understand this is the sky above us as we look up from our vantage point. So what, is the, what, is the, what do the heavens tell us? It tells us that God is glorious. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And the stars are screaming out that we have a glorious God. Think about the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born. If you remember, uh, it said that the, um, they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, there, there's, there's still heavenly bodies that are screaming out every single night. There is a creator and this creator is glorious. Uh, when I look up at the night sky, I think of what David thought in Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. He said, when I consider the heavens, uh, 
the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? So he says, when I see and when I understand the vastness of our universe and how small and, and insignificant I am, I think, God, why do you think about me? Why do you love me? Why would you come to this little planet in this great universe and do what you did for us sinners, right? And so uh, uh, the Bible says that, that the heavens declare God's glory. Notice it doesn't say the heavens tell. Uh, it doesn't say the heavens are hinting at. So it's not saying the heavens are like, hey, psst, come over here. Hey, look up there. That's pretty neat, isn't it? No, it says the heavens are not insinuating. They're not intimating. The heavens are declaring. They're saying, look up. <laughs> God is great. God is glorious. Whoever created all of this is a wonderful, awesome God. What else does, uh, it's, uh, here's a, a couple of quotes. Spurgeon said, Every moment of God's existence, power, wisdom, and goodness are being sounded abroad by the heavenly heralds which shine upon us from above. Right? Another thing he said, uh, I, I included in your notes, he who looks up to the firmament and then writes, down him, writes himself down an atheist brand him, brands himself at the same time as an idiot or a liar. Right? So, I mean, how, how can you look up at the sky and see what God has done and say that there is no God? Right? He said, you're either an idiot, you're either a fool, you're, you're, you're not clicking right up there, or you're a liar. And the Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 1 that the people who call themselves atheists, they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They're lying. They actually do believe that there's a God. They don't want to be accountable to that God. So the second thing we learn is that God is not just glorious, but He's also skilled. It says, the firmament showeth His handiwork. Okay? Now, if, if I were to come in and brag about how great of an artist I was, you would say, okay, Show me the proof, right? Show me, show me your beautiful artwork. And then if I brought to you a stick figure with a three-fingered person and a disfigured face, then you would realize I'm lying, right? I, he's, he's not an artist, right? Unless you walk into one of those modern art museums and then you see the junk that they're peddling as art. But uh, anyways, you'd say, show me your work, right? Well, well God shows us his work everywhere we go, right? And we, we see the beauty of nature and we see the handiwork. I think you guys were able to go to Prince Edward Island here recently and just see the, the beauty that God created up there. We got someone that's getting ready to go see the Niagara Falls. And I, mean, I love, I love being able to travel around and see the beauty that God has created all around us. But when we look at the heavens, it shows us the, the, his, his handiwork. When you step outside and, the, and you bask in the beauty of the sky, you cannot help but be impressed by the skill and the handiwork of God. All the other artists on the world, in the world, they're trying to in, in, intimidate, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not intimidate, they're trying to impersonate, in, 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 I, I put imita imitate, that's the word. They try to imitate his workmanship, but they fall vastly short. If you don't see God's glory in the heavens, you're not looking for it. Uh, one of the things we love about being here in East Texas is the sunsets. We have, we have the most beautiful sunsets here. And um, a lot of times we'll be outside with the kids and the sun will, sun will start setting. And you can't really see it where we're at because there's a lot of trees around the house. And so we'll all hop in uh, my truck and we'll drive a few blocks west. And there's a hill that we can, that we can kind of park the car on. We just sit back and, and watch the sunset. It's just, it's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Everything turns red or, or orange or, or pink sometimes. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. It all screams. Number one, that God is glorious and that God is a master artist. And if you look at verse number uh, two, you're going to see that the knowledge of God is being broadcasted to us constantly from the heavens. In verse number two, it says, day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. This is something that we experience daily and nightly. It's not something that happens once a year, or once a month, or once a week. It's something that happens every single day. 
Day after day, night after night, we are shown things about God from nature. We see his beautiful handiwork and we see his glory on display. Look at verse number three. It says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What does that tell us? That tells us that nature's revelation, what nature is telling us about God is universal. There's not one person on this earth that doesn't get general revelation. Everyone receives this revelation from God. There, there are some mediums that you can use to convey some, a message to someone that you, can use, that you don't have to use language, right? Music is one of them, right? Um, I, I like to listen to classical music whenever I'm uh, studying for a sermon or writing a sermon. It helps me focus in on, on what I'm thinking about and, and shut out all other distractions and noises and, and stuff like that. But you don't Classical music has no words, right? You, you, can, you can be from Russia or Taiwan or Africa or, or South America and you can listen to the same song and you can, you can get the message that the author is trying to get you, uh, get to you, uh, just listening to it, right? Another thing is, is you know, artists, right? We've, you know, my wife and I, and traveling as missionaries and stuff. Sometimes we'll get to go to a museum or something like that, and we'll get to see art. And we don't understand the language of the country that we're in, but we can see the beautiful artwork that 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 is that they're displaying, right? And so what we what we see is that God's declaration of Himself through nature is universal and does need a translator right everyone gets to hear everyone gets to see about God's glory and God's handiwork it doesn't matter what language you speak it doesn't matter what country or what time of the of uh, history you come from everyone universally understands that creation declares that God is a mighty creator Look at verse number four. It says, Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So not only does nature speak a universal language that everyone understands, but everyone has access to this, this nature that declares that God is glorious. Verse number four, it talks about the line going out into all the earth. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage, right? And so what this is talking about is, is uh, when, when people would divide up their inheritance, uh, they, would, they would cast lots and then they would find out who gets what place and what's going to be divided where. And, and he said, man, I got, a, I got a really good lot. I got a really good inheritance, right? God's been really good to me. And so when, when this is talking about the lines are following, it's talking about the boundaries of nature are limitless, that they're they're all over the place, but but they're but they're they're not they're not uh, breaking off. They're not putting a border on God's glory uh, on, that He shows us through nature. So we see the line going throughout the earth. It's talking about everyone, everywhere is able to see God's glory. And it says, and their words to the end of the world. There's no end to our our globe, our world, right? But if there was. Even at the end of the world, they would hear and see uh, God's goodness, right? Uh, what's interesting is it says um, in verse number five, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. So one of the things we got to realize is from, from verses one through four is talking about the heavens. Now from verse four C, which is the last phrase in verse number four, to verse number six, it's going to talk about a specific aspect of heaven, of the heavens, of the sky, which is the sun. Okay? And so it says, In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. So the sun's glorious light is shut up for a period of time, right? Uh, the, the, the time when it's dark outside. So it's like there's a tabernacle or a tent in the heavens that the sun goes into and then it's in there for a time and then it comes out. But when it comes out, it comes out with great pomp and ceremony. Now, in the day and age we live in, when there's a wedding, who is the center of attention? It's the bride. But back in those days, it wasn't the bride. It was the bridegroom or the, bri the groom. Okay? And so the groom was the one who would get, I mean, I'm sure the bride would get dolled up uh, as, as well. But the groom was the center of attention. And everyone was waiting for the exit of the groom into the wedding party. And so it's like 
everyone's waiting, you know, just like we're we're waiting to hear here comes wait, that's not the right one. It's dun 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 right? So anyways, I get it mixed up. But my wife was wanting to rebel. Uh, and, you know, I had to put my foot down right at the beginning, right as we were getting married. She's wanting to walk down the aisle to some other song other than Here Comes a Bride. And I told her that was heresy. We're not allowing that in this house. And I almost, I, I almost called off the wedding a couple weeks ago because my sister did not walk down to Here Comes a Bride. And so, anyways, uh, you know. We're all waiting for that time when the doors fling open and you hear the, the music, dun, 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 and then the dad takes the bride down. Well, back then, it was the opposite. It was everyone was waiting in anticipation for the groom to come out, right? And so it's almost like the groom has secluded his, himself in a, in a tabernacle, in a tent, and he's in there getting ready for the wedding. And then we're all sitting here. We're all, there's a buzz going on. When is that, when is that groom coming out? We can't wait. The, the bride's here. We're all here. And then he comes out, right? And that's like the sunrise every single morning. The sun comes out of his tent, comes out of his tabernacle, just like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And then it says, uh, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Now, we have the Olympics coming up soon, and uh, soon we're going to see a lot of races, right? And, and I, if I remember when I was a kid, it was, it was Michael Johnson. He was the fastest man uh, on the earth. I think it was the, the 200 and the 400 and all that kind of stuff. And he had the golden sneakers. I don't know if you remember that. He was faster than everyone. And when Michael Johnson went out onto the track, everyone was looking just at Michael Johnson. There were hundreds of athletes running all, but everyone was just looking at Michael Johnson. And Michael Johnson had the arrogance to hold the attention of the crowd. And everyone was watching how he was getting ready and everyone was watching how he ran and everyone was watching how he celebrated how he put his suit back on and, and, and left and everyone was watching him the whole time right now, I remember uh, my, my favorite baseball player for the longest time was Mark McGuire and one time we went to a game in St. Louis and he was injured and I knew he was in a dugout and so the whole time, I was waiting for him to poke his little head out of that dugout. I just wanted to get a little glimpse of my, of my baseball hero. And, and one time he came out, and, and we all cheered everyone that was there. There he is. And, and, and it, it, he, th this is what it's talking about. There's, there's just a lot of anticipation, and we're waiting for the moment when the sun comes out. When the sun comes out, it's just an amazing experience, right? I think Usain Bolt is, was the big guy that, of the last few uh, uh, Olympics, and and he was so fast, everyone was only talking about him. And, 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 and anyways, that's, that's what it's like when the sun comes out in the morning. Uh, we, we, we see the majestic sunrise and we're sidetracked by its beauty and by its splendor. And then look at verse number six. His, it's talking about the sun's, going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit is unto, into, unto the ends of it. So it goes from the end of one side of the earth to the end of the other side of the earth. And that's from our vantage point, it starts on one side, one horizon goes to the other horizon. Starts in the west, ends in the east, right? Or north, I'm just kidding, I know. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is a wonderful depiction of our glorious God. This, is, this sunrise is glorious, majestic, universal, and it affects everyone. And it's the same way with God. No one is exempt from knowing about Him. All the heavens declare His existence and glory. And I was going to save this to the end, but I can't wait. Okay, the S-U-N here in verses 4 through 6 is a, is a picture, is a sliver of the S-O-N. Okay, because when God came to this earth, it was something amazing. It was something glorious. And we bask, even to this day, 2,000 years later, we bask in the awesomeness of the, of the uh, uh, appearance of, of the Son of God into this world. And, and all of creation was waiting for that moment. We were saying, okay, we're here, we're ready. When are you coming? When are you coming? And He came, and we haven't got over it. It's been 2,000 years, and we still haven't got over what He did when He came to save us from our sins. So there's your Jesus in Psalm chapter 19. Now let's go on to verses 7 through 11. In this, we see reflections on the Scripture's revelation of God. So first of all, we looked at general revelation. Now we're looking at 
special revelation, okay? So I'm so thankful for nature and what nature shows us about God, but nature alone is not sufficient for us. General revelation is sufficient for our condemnation, but not sufficient for our salvation, Okay, let me explain what that, that means. So the Bible tells us in Romans 1, because of general revelation, there are two aspects of general, general revelation. There's creation and conscience. This, this knowledge that God has given everyone, that He exists, that there is a right, there is a wrong, and, and that God does have a holy standard. We are sinners, right? And so everyone... Everyone has this knowledge. It doesn't matter if they're a, a, a cannibal on some far jungle that we haven't even discovered. They speak a language we still haven't even been able to interpret yet. They still have general revelation. And that, is, that is enough for them to know that there is a God, that, that there is right and wrong, things like that. But it doesn't tell them about Jesus Christ. It doesn't tell them about being saved by grace through faith. That's why we send missionaries. Because the Bible says, how shall they hear, uh, how should they uh, believe, if, uh, let's see, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, right? And then it says in verse number 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God. Now, if we believe that everyone was okay, I mean, if people don't know about God, then God will still, you know, have mercy on them and save them. Then the, the worst thing we could ever do is send them missionaries because now they would be held accountable, right? But the Bible says everyone's accountable because everyone knows that there is a God. The Bible says in Romans 1, 18 through 20, they are without excuse. They're without an objection before God. No one will stand before God and say, God, I didn't know you exist. But I also believe that God is faithful and anyone who will seek Him, they will find Him. Even if they're on some far, far and wide place in the earth, some jungle outside, God will send them a messenger they will hear the gospel. They will believe it, right? And so, uh, anyways, um, we're getting a little off topic here. But for our salvation, for our sins, we need special revelation. We need the written word of God. In this section, we see six descriptions of the Bible. Each one of these descriptions tells us the truth about God's word. We see that the Bible is referred to as the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and the judgments of the Lord. And so what's interesting is, is Psalm 119, so we got, we're 19, right? But 100 Psalms later, Psalm 119 does the exact same thing. It uses all these other descriptions that are talking about the Bible, right? And so I could call my wife by many different names. I could call her dear. I can call her honey. In, um, uh, in Russia, we'd say daragaya. It's, that would be dear, right? My dear one or something like that. Um, in, in, in Russian, you actually say for your, you, you can say my favorite wife. You be my Ajanamaya, right? So, anyways, you're, you're my. So I, there are many different descriptors that we can say about our wife, my wife, and they're all talking about different ways I feel about her. That's the same thing that's going on in verses 7 through 11. It's all talking about the Bible, but the statutes, the judgments, the testimony, these are all different aspects of God's Word. So let's look at what this tells us about the Bible. Verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is pretty good, converting the soul. Wait, that didn't say pretty good, does it? What does it say? Perfect! Amen. Perfect. Guess what the first thing we learn? The Bible is perfect. Perfect. Amen. Amen. The Bible is perfect. Uh, the Bible is exactly what we need. It's the silver bullet. It's the only thing, right? It's the only thing that can save your soul. It's the only thing that's completely cleansed of any impurity, without any human admixture in any way. And it's the only thing that converts the soul. It's what saves us. It's what quickens us, makes us alive. Nature can inspire us and show us some great things about God, but only the Bible can convert the soul, can save us. Look at the rest of verse number 7. It says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now that word sure means firm, right? It's unwavering. That's a great description of the Bible. The Bible, God's word is firm. It's unwavering. It's, it's like the, the rock 
in the middle, uh, like, uh, uh, like the rock of Gibraltar out there uh, uh, on the edge of the sea. And the waves are beating up against that rock and they're smashing up against it. But it's the waves that are getting destroyed, not the rock, right? The rock is standing firm. The rock is standing solid. And there have been many people and nations and, and groups of people who have tried to destroy the Bible. I think I've, I mentioned this sometime. Uh, Voltaire was a French atheist who hated God. And he said, one of these days, the Bible, he said, in 50 years, the Bible will be extinct. You know what happened? In, in 50 years, he was dead. And then a, a Bible printing society bought his house and started printing Bibles out of his house. Right? Let God be true and every man a liar. Right? And so everyone who stands up against the Bible and tries to discredit the Bible or say that their mistakes or men have changed it over the years or, or it's no longer God's word anymore, anything like that, they've been found liars and God has been found true. Waves of time, opposition, and hostility have repeatedly crashed against it, but it remains sure. The waves were destroyed. God's words stand, stood firm. The sure, unwavering word of God doesn't just convert us, doesn't just save us. It also grows us. It makes wise the simple. You know, it's not good enough for us to simply be converts. Just for us to simply be safe from our sins. We need to become disciples. The Bible says God wants us to be mature. He wants us to be complete uh, in, in Him. And we, as we open up the precious pages of the Bible, God's wisdom is opened up to us and makes us wise. Look at verse number 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So here we see that the Bible is, is right. What the Bible says and what the Bible tells us to do is not mostly, not 96% of the time, it's always right. Always right. When we follow what the Bible tells us to do, the Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And what does that bring to us when we know that God is with us, that God is directing our steps? It brings us joy. That's what this talks about. Rejoicing the heart. When I know that God loved me so much that He inspired his word and he preserved his word and I have access to his word and I can read it in, a, in my own language today and, 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 and I can understand what he wants to tell me. I, it rejoices me. I, I rejoice saying, God, you are so great. Thank you for loving me in the way that you have. Thank you for doing everything that you ha have done so that I have your word in my language 2,000 years after it was completed, right? The Christian life is not a life of drudgery or dullness. The Christian life lived according to the Bible is a vibrant, exciting, joyous life. And one without a hangover. Think about it. You, you live your life as a Christian. You do, you're obedient to God and you, you get the joy and you get the peace and, and everything that God uh, promises you and, and you, you get the thrill of being one of God's children. You don't have to worry about the side effects. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen a few hours or in the, next, the early morning uh, time or anything like that, right? The Bible is right, rejoicing the heart. Look at the rest of verse number 8. It says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There are no errors in the Bible. There are no contradictions in the Bible. There are no false teachings in the Bible. It is entirely pure without any human admixture. Because it is pure, it enlightens our eyes. Now, there's only one time in the Bible that we get an illustration of what it means to have enlightened eyes. And you know what that, that, that story, that, that occasion is? It's in 1 Samuel chapter 14, and it's when uh, God is delivering, excuse me, <coughs> God is delivering the Philistines into the hand of King Saul. And King Saul gets arrogant and boastful. It all starts off because David and his armor bearer he says, hey, let's just go up there and see what God will do. And then God, they were able to kill a whole garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines started getting scared. And the Israelites were emboldened. And they started running after them. And they had a great victory that day. And Saul made this arrogant statement. He says, nobody gets to eat anything until we rout them tonight. And so... Uh, he forbade anyone from eating. And he said, if you eat, he said, we'll kill you. 
And his son Jonathan, apparently, as we understand, didn't know about this command. And he's chasing after some Philistines. And he sees uh, some honey in a tree. And he takes his staff and he starts eating that hum honey. And he's tired. He's wore out from, from killing all these Philistines. And, and that's, we're talking about, I mean, this is hard work. And he's running and he's slashing and he's, you know, de defending. And this is a lot of mental work. It's a lot of physical work. And the Bible says he was tired, he was weary, but when he took that honey right out of the honeycomb, the Bible says his eyes were enlightened, right? And so the Bible says that uh, here in our text that the Bible does that for us. The Bible enlightens our eyes. It opens us up to a whole new world. Uh, the true world. We see everything in a different light. We see everything as it was really meant to be seen. Our, our priorities have been totally rearranged, right? We used to live for ourselves and our own pleasures, and now we see that there's more to life. It's like we've taken the red pill, right? And we, we see that there's, there's a whole nother world, there's a whole nother life out here to live, and it's the better life, the life with Christ. And then in verse number 9, <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. So from the Bible, we are taught the fear of the Lord, right? That's the beginning of knowledge. And that fear that the Bible teaches us causes us to cleanse our hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, right? It, it causes us to realize <clears throat> we're in trouble. We need to get right with God before He comes back. The Bible not being perverted in any way by man or demon or anything else is completely clean and it will endure forever. And now look at verse number 9. At the end of verse number 9 it says, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then verse number 11 says, Moreover, by them, by the judgments of the Lord, is thy servant warned. So from this we understand the Bible is altogether true and righteous, warning the servant of the Lord. Every word of the Bible is completely true and completely righteous. And this is specifically talking about the judgments of God that we see in the Bible. God being all wise, righteous, the holy judge of the universe will always do what is right. We had an uh, instance, we're going through the Bible in the morning, uh, we just finished up 2 Samuel uh, this morning, and uh, w one of our kids said, well, that, was that really right of God to do that? And I told this child, I'm not going to say which one it was, I said, this, I, I almost said the name, child of mine? God always does what's right. And if we ever think, we ever get the hint of saying, God, did you, did you really do what was right there? We need, to, we need to realize that we're not looking at things the right way because God sees everything from a whole different perspective. God sees the end from the beginning. God knows what He's doing every step of the way. And there may be times where we think that God is being unjust or maybe God should have done something in a different way, but God always does what is right. Okay? His judgments are true and righteous altogether. Right? Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing, but we must trust that He always does what is right. Right? I explained that our two-year-old doesn't really understand what's going on and maybe thinks that mom and dad are being wrong or harsh because of this or because of that. But he doesn't realize what mom and dad are doing, right? It's the same way with us. We don't understand what God is doing. We just need to trust him as a child would trust his parents. God's judgments warn the servant of the Lord. And we've talked about this many times and we'll talk about it many more times because obedience brings blessing, but disobedience brings cursing. Now, there's a parenthesis in between verses 9 and 10, or 9 and 11, and it's verse number 10. And it says, and when it talks about the judgments of the Lord, which is a reference to the Bible, it says, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So the, the Bible, God's words, are more precious than gold. Then, and, and it doesn't just say gold. It says, than much fine gold. And then sweeter than honey right out of the honeycomb. Now, there are many people who have given their lives. I, need, I don't have the time for that. Anyways, there are many people who have given their lives in pursuit of gold. Right? But guess what? 
Gold, pursuing after gold in this world is an empty pursuit. Guess what? You're going to die one of these days and you're not going to take that gold with you. But guess what? You have the words of God that are much more precious than the finest gold that this world has to offer. And, and there's nothing sweeter. We, we had um, uh, friends of ours in, in Russia and in Ukraine that, uh, that they kept bees and, and made honey products and things like that. And I've had honey, fresh honey, right out of the honeycomb. And there's nothing sweeter. It's almost too sweet. Hurts my mouth and, and, and everything. It's just, it's so sweet. Makes you want to pucker for five minutes, right? There's nothing sweeter than that. And, and guess what? The Bible is sweeter. God's words to the Christian are sweeter than honey right out of the honeycomb. Look at verse number 11. It says, And in keeping of them there is great reward. Guess what? The Bible rewards those that obey it. There's great reward promised to those who keep and obey God's words. Now let's look um, at the last point here. Reflections on my own sinfulness. We've seen God's revelation through nature. We've seen God's revelation through His word. And now we're going to look at ourselves. After we look at God, we look at ourselves. You know, we can be easily diluted and self-deceived. We can easily think that everything's okay with us. I'm perfectly fine. You know, if there's a judgment day, look at me. I'm, I'm a good person. I, I mean, I will see what Brother Larry does, what Brother Steve does. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty well off. I'm going to be okay. But then we see God in His righteousness. Uh, uh, then we see God in His truth and we realize there's, we've been self-deceived. Uh, let me quickly give you this illustration. If you ever watched that show American Idol, I don't, I don't even know, if, I'm sure it probably hadn't been on for a long time. I remember when I was a kid, we used to watch that show and, and my favorite part was the very beginning when they had to open the auditions and you get someone who's really confident and they're like, oh, I'm the best. I'm going to win. And then they get out there in front of those judges and they're singing their way off tune and they're plugging their ears and they're saying, stop, 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 you're horrible. And uh, anyways, I don't know why I like that, but anyways, these people were self-deceived. We can easily be self-deceived. And then we come to God's word and we realize, hey, 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 hold up here. God is righteous and I am not. Now, verse number 12 tells us that we can be so sinful that we don't even know all of our own sins. It says, who can understand his errors? Who can understand his own errors? It's easy for me to pick out Brother R.C.'s sins and Brother R Richard's sins. It's easy for me to pick them apart. Oh, he does this wrong and she does that wrong. But it's, you know what? It's hardest of all to see my own sins. Why? I, I like to justify myself. I know my own intentions and motives behind that. And, and, and so I always justify myself. But when I see James doing something, I am harsh with him. Right? So this is what this is talking about, right? It says, who can understand his own errors? That's why he says, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Lord, help me when I'm so deluded and I'm so deceived thinking that everything's okay and I'm still in sin. Lord, forgive me of the sin that I don't even know that I'm committing. That's what he says. Look at verse number 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now, here we see sins that in verse number 12, we don't even know we're committing. Verse number 13 is talking about the opposite sin. It's talking about the sin of presumption. That's a sin you know is wrong and you still do it. Uh, what's interesting is, is we don't have the time to do it. We're going to skip over this. But Numbers chapter 15, you can go back and read that yourself. Numbers 15 talks about there was a, there was a sacrifice for a, a, a sin that was committed unknowingly. But there was no sacrifice, no atonement for a presumptuous sin. When you know it's wrong and you still go forward and do it, in the Old Testament there was no atonement, no forgiveness for that kind of sin. But let me just give you a, a little ray of hope. Um, in the New Testament, the Bible says that Calvary covers it all. There's, there's no sin that is too great that God cannot cover, right? This doesn't give me a license to live in sin, but I do have the assurance that whenever I do fall in sin, even presumptuously from time to time, I can take comfort in the fact that God will forgive me from even that great of a sin. Now look at the last verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I, I use this verse frequently when I pray because I know how wicked my heart is. I know how wicked my thoughts are. And I know how wicked my words can be. And, and I don't want to sin with my body 
I don't want to sin with my mouth and I don't want to sin with my heart, right? I'm so sinful that my words and my thoughts are often not acceptable to God. And this is where it all starts. We talked about this on Sunday morning. Murder doesn't start with your hands. It starts in your heart, right? Matthew 15, uh, if, if you want to take a look at it later, we're not going to look at it right now, but verses 16 through 20, it says, Out of the heart proceed evil things, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, wickedness, blasphemies. That's what defiles a man, what comes out of his heart, not what he eats, not eating with unwashed hands or anything like that. Our hearts are wicked, our hearts are defiled, and a Christian desires to please God with his actions and with the thoughts of his heart. And so he prays, God, Help me in this area. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Right? That's what we want. We want not just, not just the, the facade that we show on the outside to be good, but we want to be right on the inside. Right? And so, man, I love this. And we could have spent a few hours talking about the beauty of this psalm. But we saw God reveals himself to us through nature. He reveals himself to us through his word. And once we do, we realize our sinfulness. And so we ask for God's help. Lord, help me. Forgive me from the sins that I don't know that I'm committing. Lord, forgive me when I sin presumptuously. And Lord, help me so that the thoughts of my heart and the words of my mouth are acceptable in your sight. We want to we want to be honoring and pleasing to the one who's been so good to us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Thank you so much for your revelation. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember what you've called us to. You've called us to light, not to darkness. You've called us to holiness, not to sinfulness. Bless this rest of this time we have in Jesus' name.